uh, you all have this program uh, which is uh, somewhat wrongly typed also because that's my mistake my apologies uh, for those uh, but um, so that we can quickly go through the program and and also uh, be on the same page that what are the things that will follow um, first of all um, why this program was organized um, as the open uh, educational resource movement started uh, of course it started without the name before in fact uh, uh, one of the thing that uh, 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 professor raj dhanrajan was part of uh, when uh, call initiated was stamp 2000 plus uh, was uh, a set of material developed by teachers in south in africa uh, multi country uh, activity for teacher education these materials were developed by teachers for sharing amongst teachers teacher at teachers training institution in in africa and elsewhere at that our uh, world of course before that uh, the commonwealth of learning when in 87 was established one of the specific mandate of commonwealth of learning is to engage in in sharing of educational resources that's uh, that's ex uh, in the explicit objective of mandate of commonwealth of learning within that framework the sharing activities uh, of uh, exchange of materials were being done and then stamp 2000 plus happened sometime in 2001 the the mit open course were uh, started and uh, at the same time there was another movement that was also going on which uh, raj mentioned about open access in which i was working in and the unesco last uh so both oer and open access were work, uh, starting to emerge in 2001 and in 2002 uh, looking into the development of uh, OER, uh, this open courseware movement unesco convened a meeting with the help of hewlett foundation in 2002 where professor prasad was uh, a, a, a member and i am very happy that you are here uh, in this meeting today um and professor prasad uh, is is being considered as a pioneer in in oer movement and that, that and you will find if you read some of the material you will find several of his thoughts and and ideas are being quoted differently where uh, in in uh, what he told in those days as a mission vision of open educational resources and it was in that uh, meeting though it was not decided that it will be oer but the dart meeting in in 2002 coined this phrase open educational resources since 2002 a lot of water has flown a lot of activities has happened uh, at that time oer the or, the idea in that meeting was to create uh, a, a world where educational in, uh, literature or teaching and learning materials are freely available as a knowledge commons that was the the idea uh, in 2002 then it went on different progress different projects happened at 2012 and 10 years of celebration commonwealth of learning and unesco again came together came out with a declaration called unesco uh, call unesco paris declaration on oer 2012 it called it the the congress world oer congress in june 2012 was attended by uh, our 70 countries and our 350 delegates and they came out with with a declaration which is a non binding uh, resolution from unesco uh, but it calls upon the member states of unesco which is 195 countries to look at oer from a certain angle of sharing uh, sharing resources developing policies developing capacities undertaking research using open standards these are some of the key highlights of o, o, o that uh, uh, declaration and i would urge all of you to look at those policy it calls upon three groups of people uh, the policy makers inst- the national policy makers the institutional policy makers or institutional leaders and teachers per se the three groups of people has the role to promote and develop oer and that was the kind of focus over 250 projects uh, are there now in on oer all over the world but when you look at these oer materials many of these oer materials have just started and not completed many time the materials are created 
with, with the enthusiasm of individuals and enthusiasm of individual leaders, but it is not taken beyond. Many of these materials therefore lacks quality. That it is not, the, the objective is to reuse, use and reuse, but many cannot be used and reused because they are not completed at all. It's always work in progress. Um, all discussions and deliberations in the last 10 years calls upon quality issues to be looked at. But if you look at what are the quality guidelines, you will find very little indicators, very little guidance to look at quality. That's not because of depth of expertise or people's thinking. But there are two groups of people who are actually driving the OER movement. One set of people, they believe that you don't need a quality guidelines. They believe that quality comes out of people's engagement in OER because OER is people's movement, teachers' movement. They will prepare materials. Quality will emerge out of it. Quality will come out of uses when more and more people use the materials. And then automatically quality will happen. If you have a quality strictures, quality assurance processes, then not many people will get onto use of OER. This is one set of people. There is other group of people who think that there is a need for structured guidelines for teachers to think about OER. There is a way of looking at OER that should be usable by specific groups of people. This, the, because of this, this difference in views in the OER movement itself, a comprehensive set of guidelines on developing OER has not yet come out. We all use in our, as teachers, in our own way, whether OER or non-OER, when we decide a learning resource, we have certain criteria for ourselves. So we know what is quality of, for our students. But we really don't really explicitly tell that about uh, open educational resources. Looking into this and large number of uh, committees, large number of conferences and seminars emphasizing on quality OER, at SEMCA we thought it is better to look at OER from a holistic perspective, quality holistic perspective, and come out with set of guideline that can be adaptable and adaptable by di di uh, different stakeholders. The, especially the three perspective and three type of stakeholders that was emphasized by Professor Prasad and Professor Dhanrajan. Everyone will look into different criteria. So we want to have a set of criteria and guideline which can be adaptable by everyone. As a teacher, I can pick and choose what are the things I want to use as uh, institution uh, what are the things I want to look at? Can we develop these kind of things? And then we, we started thinking, uh, and then uh, Professor Paul Koachi came in and uh, has helped us to come out with a whole lot of criteria that has been distributed. We are here uh, to discuss about those criteria and also to listen to experts, what are their views about quality in OER. All your views, all your work in the group discussions that we follow on will be assembled by Professor Paul Kawachi and will come out with a third guideline, a draft guideline, which will be openly available. Others can make comment and we can refine. And then, of course, one individual might like to implement, one institution might like to implement. And then maybe next three years, we'll have a set of criteria, which will, of course, will be open again because it has to be open and dynamic. It cannot be prescriptive and normative all the time. So that's the, that's the idea we have started, and that's what we are looking at. At SEMCA, we are actually very much involved in OER, um, all aspects of OER development. Um, one, I'll just highlight a few things that we are doing. One of the objective of uh, engaging in OER is to, is to be um, a regional hub on all issues related to OER at SEMCA, so that we can provide assistance to a to policymakers, teachers, and institution on OER promotion and development. So one of the things that we are working with Vavasan Open University is to develop a capacity building professional, continuous professional development course on OER based e-learning. This course we hope will be available by the end of this year and will be available as a small uh, MOOC, massive but MOOC, small MOOC for institutions. 
uh, so that institutions can offer those courses for their capacity building of teachers. That's one aspect of looking at things. The second aspect of uh, we are working on advocacy. Advocacy for OER, and therefore we are working with senior leaders, and that's one of the activity that we did at B.R. Ambedkar Open University, where 20 senior leaders, vice chancellors, participated. And um, the, we discussed on a template, OER institutional policy template. So now we have a draft OER institutional policy template that any institution can adopt and adapt very easily into their own institutional policy framework, take it to their, um, their um, institutional policy making body like academic council and, and governing boards and then adopt that easily and, and put, put into practice. That's second level. The third level of thing that we are working on is the quality. So we are working on three things at the advocacy level and the capacity building level and the quality assurance level. This activity in quality assurance is to develop the guideline and then of course to implement, to develop courses, assist people to develop courses and implement these gui guidelines to see whether it is ap uh, feasible, applicable or not. So there will be also assistance on course development uh, 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 later on. We are working with various partners for this and that's, that's one of the strategy for Commonwealth of Learning to work. Partnership is very important. These are the things that are behind this workshop uh, as to make it open that why Semka and Call is doing this work. Let me now come to this uh, schedule. Uh, after this uh, thing, uh, Paul is going to make a brief overview on OER. To put things in context, some of you uh, from um, the, the university, Manu, may not be aware of whole OER context. So this is also will help you to, to bring on board because this is not rocket science. You are all OD distance open learning people. You will be easily able to adopt, adapt. Uh, there is also a resource, uh, a book that's uh, uh, edited by, by uh, uh, Raz and, and David uh, that is distributed. Raz, I'm happy and thankful to you that you allowed us to distribute. You'll be happy to know that this book has now been distributed to over 150 people uh, by Semka. So, uh, uh, and, and, and this is also distributed here. So this is also a good learning resource to, to review, read at, at leisure time. So that will be a presentation. Post lunch, we are going to have presentations by the, the visiting experts here. Uh, one presentation will be by uh, Professor Aptar Kaur, uh, the second presentation will be by Professor Navi Works Javani. Uh, and third uh, presentation will be by uh, Professor Abdul Manan. The fourth uh, brief uh, interaction or comment uh, presentation will be by Professor B. Venkaya. Uh, fourth, that is the fourth one. Uh, post tea session uh, will be the kind of introduction to the framework the quality framework that Prof. Paul has worked on. And he will also share on the international consultation that he engaged with over 50 experts uh, on the work he has collected. So that's, and also that will be followed by group group discussion. I think we'll break into groups here, two or three groups, and two or three groups will be in the community room there so that we can work on, on groups. And groups will present their thoughts on, based on what Paul is going to talk about. Tomorrow morning, uh, the presentations will be from uh, Professor Mohan Menon is coming, going to join us tomorrow morning. Uh, presentation from Professor Mohan Menon, who is Assistant v Vice Chancellor at Vavasan Open University. Uh, then uh, Dr. Pradeep Mishra. Um, then uh, Dr. Vizita, uh, uh, Vice Chancellor of uh, Open University of Sri Lanka. Professor Uma Kanjilal, Dr. Pokhriyal, Delhi University, and uh, we may have a short interactive presentation from Dr. Savitri Singh. Uh, I hope she will be joining soon with us uh, today. Dr. Savitri Singh with, is with uh, Acharya Narendra Dev College in uh, Delhi University. Uh, she has been working on OER for quite a long time, and she has got an award last year for open education, commendable award certification from European Union's o OPAL project. Uh, and we hope she will be here and make a small presentation on that.
The rest of the three sessions on tomorrow will be followed in chunks, uh, triggered by Paul Akwachi in groups. So he will have a small triggering presentation followed by group discussions coming out with what will work, what will not work, and, and all kinds of suggestions that will come up. Essentially, today and tomorrow's two days uh, sessions are loosely organized session. Um, we'll have, uh, there is not structuring enough other than the kind of presentation that we are talking about. The participants' presentations, two sessions, uh, we have requested Professor V.S. Prasad to chair and moderate the discussion. Um, other sessions will be managed by Paul himself, and it is largely uh, participant-centered. Paul is here to actually uh, uh, precon your brains, precon your ideas, and collect collect information. He is going to make small presentation. His his biggest presentation, which will be less than thirty minutes now, uh, will be followed now only. Thank you, uh, everyone. I hope the 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 clarification on on this uh, schedule is clear. I'm not talking about day three. Day three will be talked by by Paul tomorrow uh, at the end. Thank you very much, Paul. Now I hand it over to you. I think we we have one uh, we have time up to 1:30. We'll, we'll break at 1:30. So you have the time, and you may like to have comments and questions as well during that time. You can do that there, or you want here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Patience, listening to me. I'm reminded at first when I put these PowerPoint switched on that I read and I prepared all my PowerPoint like that. But when I went to a developing country, their electricity power and their projectors were so weak, they couldn't see the slides. So I've now changed back to white background and dark blue. So we have to stay flexible, not say, this is the best quality, you are wrong. No, 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 <laughs> just change to suit the context. So, all this work is basically I put online because my life is under construction and the latest versions are always there for you and they are there. So, this idea of reusable learning objects, this is one of the key things. It's been called Lego blocks. I don't know if you know Lego blocks, so I went to a little shop before I caught the plane. These little blocks that you can fit together in different ways and then build up a syllabus or whole course out of them. These were meant to be context free without any sort of ownership or pedagogy involved. And you put them together, the teacher puts them together. Now, this was 10 years ago, and they were thought to be the key answer to the world's education. But there were many problems with these, especially the fact that they were context-free, and a lot of teachers are saying, even in India, take a good teacher teaching well in India, use a video camera, and let's multiply it 10,000 times to reach everyone with contextualized learning. So there's this tension between having context-free chunks and contextualized learning. And other barriers, of course, the relevance, that there's no needs analysis these had many problems. Another problem happened was that 
these units and the funding for them by, for example, the World Bank into Africa particularly, they were used for higher education in universities for the rich elites and not particularly helping the poor. So funding dried up and RLL movement, I'm not sure if it's dead, I'm not sure if it's sort of metamorphosed into the OER movement, but I think we had better reflect on what happened with RLO. And are we going along the same road to oblivion? Are we producing OER for the elite universities, for students who are qualified like MOOC for Harvard, MIT? Or are we trying to reach the poor? So I think Dana Rajan mentioned, if I can quote, correctly, I-N-Q-U-A-A-H-E. It's very impressive, but the last two letters, H-E, higher education, to me, it's like serving the rich. And I wish, my passion, is that we can think about OER could be used in primary schools, for primary education, for the unreached, for those out of school, trying to find work, that OER can be more transformative than elitist. So I hope we can think about this, that we're not producing your grand lesson to give to other high, rich children or students, but think about other persons. As a general introduction, it's there, OERR by UNESCO and for non-commercial purposes. For non-commercial purposes. And then along comes Creative Commons saying, well, you could put NC if you wish, or you could do it for commercial purposes. So I think we have to be open in how we're going to interpret and define these. And I had a plan that we could actually look at how to define as a process, like Wayne McIntosh said, as a process, how we can revise or perhaps improve the definition. There are differences between RLO and OER. And OER sometimes a teaching chunk that can be, that can have learning assessment, self-assessment of learning, whereas a Lego brick is just a Lego brick. And of course we should be looking at how they're going to be used in practice. And the OAP movement, the OPAL movement. I like their approach because they do have the left column here of no use of OER. For example, do you teach? Do you use OER in your lessons? You think, oh, not for me not invented here, not, I don't use them. So you are included. This is an inclusive framework here. I like that. And the movement from teacher-centeredness to learner-centeredness and independent learning is included. So it's a very nice framework to think about. That's the stolen version. So I did have a plan of we have work to do <laughs> and it's, I've, had, I've had headaches. But there are some technical difficulties with vocabulary and well, I like the challenge, but 
I thought that if we could have something take away fun or useful as well, but we may not have time for that, but it's almost holding it out like a carrot that if we finish the work, we could look at something else. But I was thinking of look at our own philosophy of education, and I'll talk about that later, and then how we would put that into a teaching chunk, and then if we share them in a team. And most OER are produced. I saw some produced last week from a workshop. And maybe they'll never be used again. The internet is just a huge dumping ground, a graveyard of sorts. So I was thinking if we chose an example of the topic I was thinking was if we all the different groups were going to try to put their philosophy into an OER, then why not choose a topic like study skills for online students and each group work on the same topic? And it's surprising that that echoes uh, uh, Manu President Mohammed Mian said that please consider OER for student support. I think that's very powerful because we produce OER, but students don't know and teachers don't know how to use them, when to use them. And study skills, every university has study skills booklets. The students never read them. They're not entertaining, they're not engaging, they're not... So we could perhaps think about something like that, that we could share, and every open university, every person in the world would be able to look at them. So study skills. I was talking to Raj yesterday, and we were thinking that we have to also think about not just education, but in China, I was there for five years, there's a great trouble with migrant workers coming into the city and their children need education. So John Daniel recently adapted, changed his triangle to a pentagon to include good governance and sort of how to live. So I would reflect on the president's words and I would reflect on Raj's ideas and I would think that maybe we could have a different topic like living in the city, that when people go to a different culture then how do they assimilate migrant workers, how can we help the poor villagers? 70% were in the village in China 10 years ago, now only 50%. That is something like two or three hundred thousand people, or two or three hundred million people have moved into the city without any idea of what an ATM is. Okay, let's, that's just a brief introduction there. And it's never ending, really. This one. This is basically what I've put documents on. I thought if I had a long speech, after one hour you fall asleep. It's like a 90 minute lesson. So I chunked everything into small user friendly pieces. For example, the, what I explained here is just a three pages as a document for what I just spoke to you is just three pages followed by the PowerPoint. So don't be frightened that if you go to this link, you'll just get a short version that you can understand and a small like an OER chunk. That's the plan.
Actually, I'm new to Windows, so <laughs> I'm amazed it works. And there was one last point I could make. I just want to add it before I forget, because I'm getting too old for this, is that Raj mentioned that some universities have their own institutional quality assurance processes. I will mention it later because those processes are expensive. And when they tried to, they tried at, in Wawasan University to produce the course with OER, the institution imposes a quality assurance program that makes the OER very expensive in the end. Now, why would universities therefore invest such money in this? You think MIT are doing it freely. They love you. What is their business plan? Lots of people have tried to suggest what their business plan is. But if you just think what they did and what has happened, I think Cambridge University was, Britain was the top ranked university in the world and maybe Oxford or some others. And MIT was the third ranked university. After they introduced MOOC and free, they're now top ranked in the world. They leapfrogged straight to the top. They're well known, they're cited by many. So there is an advantage in producing OER. And I'm looking forward to Manu leapfrogging to the top. So there is a benefit. Now, I'm not sure this is unfortunate part, but we do need to be sure about our terminology. We do need to know the difference between a spade and a shovel. And when we talk with each other and listen to each other, we need to understand that what they are talking about, we have a correct interpretation. And also, different stakeholders have very different ideas of quality. Now, we will see this idea of localization, and also there is this question of internationalization. Globalization is not at all the same thing. In fact, it's opposite direction and world readiness. Now, I've tried to think about this very much to try to present it graphically. And also, when we think about the different types of users, the institution, it's got its vested interests. And we've got the students. The students' value of one of these mics maybe can be, OK, I'll talk like this. The, the students have their own interpretation of what is a good quality education. In fact, they prefer to have a career five years down the road with a big house and nice family situation. But the parents, for example, have a very different view. They want financial security of the university because it's their money. And they want a job immediately on graduation, employability. Whereas the universities have a very different thing. They want to conserve their prestige and become elite. These have very different criteria. So I think we need to look at the different levels of users. We can't try to not waste time, but we have to recognize that different people have different ideas of what are quality and what type of criteria they want to use. As Sanjaya was saying, we want to produce a framework that people can pick and mix depending on who they are for their own purpose. Not prescriptive, but very much 
we describe and offer them a candy shop and they can choose what they want. Now, localization is the idea of taking something and making it look like it's native. In a simple words. And there are many different ways we could do that. For example, it's not just the different laws, different, different driving side of the road. We take a movie from one country of a driving and try to move it into a different situation. It's, we need to adapt many different things. I am reminded that this is a sort of personalize the presentation idea that I presented a paper up for teachers in English, 36 PowerPoint presented it, and then they later said it was very good, can you please give it to us in Japanese? So I thought, okay, no problem. So zenbu kawatte shimashita and nihongo de. And then they have a different structure of speaking, not introduction, method, results, conclusion, but a kisho tenkets, and you present the conclusions, and then, and I only needed 23 slides, and they were in different order and different language. So it's not a question of just using a one word, one word dictionary translation. The cultural translation is much more complex. Internationalization is a push process where we make something reusable by making it clean. We take away the anecdotes and the local jokes, the humor, and we clean it to be reusable by other persons. We push it up to be reusable. And you know, some people have the idea that at the top, in the repositories, there are millions, but people have an idea that, oh, there's many more at the top and only one in my lesson. But at the local level, there are many, many, many more. And there is a middle level of the teachers, the translators, the providers that try to either take them from the low, lowest level and push them up The middle level takes their lessons and they uh, adapt them and push them up to the repositories. And they may look in the repositories, tagging, discoverability, pull them down, change the language, and put them into their different villages. So we've got this type of a pyramid. And the ones in the repositories should be the clean, simple ones. And the localized are more complex with the local customs and the local needs. So I want to, when we talk about quality criteria, let's don't fight that the top level, which should be context free, the top ones are context free. And, or should they be contextualized for reusing immediately in a lesson? They are different. So let's not confuse them too much. And we can think about teachers want them easy to find, easy to adapt. The students want them local language, very fun to use, local humor, local pictures. But the top people want them clean and simple. Globalization is a pull. I like what you have, give me. So take from you, clean those pictures, take out those pictures of the, from India schools, and I change it to my schools, and I 
pull down. It's a pull process, globalization. It pulls up and down. Internationalization is a push, bye-bye. But globalization is I want. World readiness is quite different. It means, can we produce something that has something for everyone? It has all the different village pictures, and you can just, you've seen those PowerPoint. At the bottom, it's got little flags for different languages. You click Thai, you click, and different languages. They are world ready, already done. But globalization, sometimes people say they have to be retrofitted because there's millions up there and we've got to somehow reuse them. We have this idea that if the teacher can make these balloons, then they will all go up to the top and they will stay in the ceiling area, the repository. And my purpose is that they all wait there to be reused and the teacher can bring them down, change the color a little, change the size a little, adapt 